Guns have been around for centuries, but no nation has embraced the firearm as much as the United States. Of the 857 million civilian-owned guns in the world, Americans own nearly half of them. But what's behind our obsession with firearms? As a crime reporter, I wanted to show how easy it is for the average American to buy a gun. This is our colleague, Andy Campbell. In 2016, Andy traveled to Orlando after the Pulse nightclub shooting. Which was, at the time, one of the worst shootings in American history. To see how easily he could buy a gun. And not just any gun. Andy wanted to buy this country's most popular assault rifle, the AR-15. It looks like a military-style weapon. It's supposed to look intimidating. It's supposed to be scary. It's supposed to um, uh, put you off guard. This type of marketing makes these types of guns fly off the shelves. It makes them um, attractive to young people. The National Rifle Association calls it America's rifle and claims it's often used for hunting. The truth is its only use is to kill people. There's no uh, no reason to use a uh, semi-automatic gun to kill a deer, for instance. So how long did it take Andy to buy an AR-15 military-style semi-automatic assault rifle? We'll get back to that. Before we talk about buying a gun in the 21st century, we first need to go back to the 18th century, where guns were unreliable, they were perishable, they were very unwieldy. Well, many of them only lasted a year or so. They were prone to rust and rot, water damage of different kinds. This is Priya Sathya, a professor at Stanford University who studies the history of firearms. So when the American colonies rebelled against Britain in the 1770s, they could no longer count on getting firearms from the British for obvious reasons. And then after the war is over, it becomes a kind of government priority to invest in firearms manufacturing capacity within the newly independent United States. So Americans made their own thanks in part to George Washington's foresight. George Washington really spearheads this effort to create government-run firearms factories. Then in the 19th century, you see those developing into large capacity factories. This begins America's long history as a dominant firearms manufacturer. By the time the Civil War has ended, America begins pushing west. And this westward expansion depended on armed men going out and engaging in wars with Native Americans. But the proliferation of guns always came with the proliferation of something else, gun control. Because there's an interest in attracting settlers, so they look they need to look like safe places to live, not actually a wild west. So in the 19th century, if you went to, you know, a small town in Kansas or one of these new places opening up in the West, there would be signs greeting you that would say, leave your revolver at police headquarters and you'll get a receipt for that. So people weren't actually walking around in these towns fully armed. The mythology of an early American society replete with lax gun laws was a 20th century invention. And it's an NRA promoted myth. It's also something that shows up in Hollywood movies at the same time. The kind of really loose interpretation that we have of the Second Amendment now is something that you can date from the 1980s onward. Starting in the 1980s and 90s, developed countries begin responding to rampant gun violence by restricting civilian gun ownership. A 1989 mass shooting in Canada leads to the passing of the Firearms Act five years later. In 1987, the Hungerford Massacre in England leads the UK to pass the Firearms Amendment Act. And in 1996, following the Port Arthur massacre, Australia bans nearly all automatic and semi-automatic weapons. So gun manufacturers focused their attention on the one developed country that was still open for business, the United States. Because markets everywhere else in the world were either glutted or they had really tight controls on civilian ownership of guns. So it became more and more important for the American civilian market to be open and for Americans to believe that to be American is to own not just one gun, but many, all the guns you can. So this is something that's being actively promoted by the NRA, which is representing gun manufacturers and from there, gun sales grew in the United States. As a national crime reporter, I write the same story at least once a week, sometimes every day. Often I will be flying back from one shooting only to be turned around and fly to another shooting. This has happened several times in my seven years here at HuffPost. Gun violence is, is such an issue that we have 
a hard time deciding which ones to cover. Priya, how long do you think it took our colleague Andy to buy an AR-15 in Orlando immediately following the Pulse nightclub shooting? Zero time? I can't, I don't know. How fast was it? During a state of emergency, I bought an AR-15 in about 38 minutes. 38 minutes? I thought it would be faster. The only reason it took 38 minutes and not less time is because there was such a backup of people buying guns. The irony of mass shootings is that for the gun industry, they're actually good for business. The only way to keep civilians in America continually engaged in buying ever more guns is by encouraging this fear that they're about to lose the right to buy guns. Hillary wants to abolish, essentially abolish the Second Amendment. There's a sort of spate of panic buying. Their goal is to eliminate the Second Amendment. Every time there's a mass shooting, Americans donate to the NRA. We're here, we're not going anywhere. And they buy AR-15s en masse. To stop a bad guy with a gun, it takes a good guy with a gun. And in turn, a vicious cycle continues. As guns pervade American society, so do mass shootings. It's why you look at the exits when you go to the theater. Um, it's why, you know, parents are telling their kids how to shelter safely at school. It's why you, you know, don't feel safe at a yoga studio anymore. And perhaps the most devastating part of all. Now mass shootings have become part of American culture. It's something that goes on that we don't correct. Mass shootings have occurred in other places and then action was immediately taken to prevent it from happening again. The kind of peculiar refusal in America to, to take that kind of action, that's American and then the mass shootings themselves are now solidly part of American culture. Our youth is growing up in an environment where they expect that walking out the door comes with an inherent risk. I heard students saying, I'm not surprised, as often as they said, I can't believe this is happening. 